Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Faisal Ismail. I'm the director of the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance. We're just waiting for colleagues to join. I see there are more people joining in that we can uh, begin in the in the meantime. Uh, let's see. Right. Just give them one more minute and then we will kickstart um, the discussion. Okay, I think colleagues will keep joining as we start. So in the interest of time, I will start. My name is Faisal Ismail. I'm the director of the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance. And uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, uh, joined uh, by Professor Mustafa. Uh, he's, uh, it's early evening there in, in Bangladesh, where he currently is. Um, Mustafa Khan um, has uh, offered to join us, although he is um, uh, working on the ground doing research in um, in Bangladesh, and he'll tell us uh, a lot more about that when he, he comes on. Uh, just to uh, perhaps uh, say a few introductory things about this lecture. This um, lecture is part of the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance guest lecture series uh, that we have started um, in 2023. Uh, the first lecture, we were privileged to have Professor Haljun Chang, uh, who uh, was at Cambridge, but um, is now at SOAS. And uh, we were uh, very privileged to have him talk to us about his uh, new book, Edible Economics. Um, and the second lecture was, pro uh, was delivered by Professor Adnan Khan, who is from the London School of Economics, but also a chief economist of the uh, FCDO. <clears throat> um, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, in London. And the third um, speaker um, this year was Dr. Jafar Jovan, uh, who is the head of the United Nations System Staff College. Uh, it was a great privilege having him here with us uh, in uh, Cape Town at our offices. He spoke to us about leadership and uh, what this means in the current uh, global uh, governance system. And today, we really are extremely privileged to have with us um, Professor um, Mushtaq Khan. He is an, uh, a really an eminent scholar in his field, an outstanding um, researcher who has really given us um, a very interesting perspective uh, about how to understand the complexities of development, democracy and development in uh, countries like ours, in Africa, in Asia, and I guess in Latin America. Um, so we in the Nelson Mandela School, um, as some of you know, we um, offer a um, master's program, a flagship master's in development uh, policy and practice, which we offer over two years. And we also offer the, the same master's program over a, a one year period. And the core of this program um, is uh, has a course on governance and development. And uh, we ourselves have been uh, doing some research in the school in, on governance and development. And we have been searching for analytical frameworks that better understand, that better help us understand our uh, complexity and how to both understand the challenges of governance whether those are related to public policy institutions or public governance institutions or industrial policy or other trade policy, trade policy and other uh, parts of uh, um, our policy framework, but also how to build better resilience, strengthen the capacity of the state to deliver. And this is where the uh, analytical frameworks that uh, Professor Khan has developed over the years um, has really uh, shone a light um, on the both the challenges we face and on how we could uh, pragmatically begin to address some of these challenges. So um, I would like to um, uh, uh, extend a warm welcome 
to Professor Khan um, where he is right now. It's much warmer than it is here in Cape Town where we are. Um, yeah, I'm told the temperatures there are well over 30 degrees. So he's um, joining us from a warm place and uh, we'd like him to um, perhaps deliver his lecture on uh, political science. This is the analytical framework that he has developed and written a number of uh, journal articles and books um, on it. Um, he is um, a leading uh, researcher who uh, works um, uh, on a research project funded by the FCDO on anti-corruption and evidence. Um, and it is a consortium of researchers and his research has extended uh, across many countries, including Bangladesh, where he's currently at, other countries in Southeast Asia, South Asia and Southeast Asia, but also including countries on the African continent, um, such as South Africa, Tanzania, and uh, Nigeria. So we're really looking forward to listen to him uh, present this analytical framework, and uh, you will have an opportunity after his lecture to ask uh, questions. So please, please feel free to write your questions into the chat. Uh, for those of you uh, who have uh, uh, you know, uh, any, any issues you want to clarify, and uh, during question time, we will um, give him an opportunity to um, address your questions. So thank you so much to Professor Khan for joining us today. And I'd like you to um, take over uh, the, uh, the session. Over to you, Professor Khan. Thank you, Faisal. So what I'm going to do today is give an introduction to a framework called the Political Settlements Framework which I've used in a whole variety of different governance and policy contexts from industrial policy, but also in terms of figuring out um, effective anti-corruption strategies, which is what I'm working on now. But today's lecture will really be focusing on giving the broad outlines of the framework so students can follow up in more detail um, later on. I'm going to share a screen um, with you and let's see if you can see this. Excellent. So that's the, the PowerPoint for the political settlements um, analysis. And it begins with asking, what are we trying to address with this framework? What, are we, what do we want to explain? And it's a number of big puzzles that started my journey on this um, analytical frame for governance analysis um, 20 plus years ago. The first was that it was clear that different countries were using similar policies, similar institutions, and achieving very different results. So industrial policy was achieving very good results in South Korea and Taiwan, but the same industrial policy in South Asia was resulting in non-performing loans and infants that never grew up. The second puzzle is that countries often successfully use very different policies to achieve similar goals. So if you look at the size of the public sector in Taiwan in the 1960s, a huge chunk of industry was in the public sector and it did extremely well. But in South Korea, the role of the private sector and the chaebol was much greater. So, and this is just you know, a random example. You find that countries have used very different institutional policies, very different strategies of ownership, and they've achieved similar goals. So not only have the same instruments resulted in very different outcomes, different instruments achieved similar outcomes. So the real policy um, challenge, and, and Faisal talked about complexity, is that what are we missing here? How do we design policies and reform strategies in a specific country, in your case, South Africa, um, I'm sitting in Bangladesh. What, how do we begin to think about what policies will be effective in this context to achieve specific goals of development, of distribution, of poverty alleviation, of economic growth, of industrialization, whatever your objective is, how do you, how do you start thinking about the policy if you know that just because that worked in some other country might not work at all in your country. So that was my starting point. 
And the political settlements framework gives an answer to this by saying, you can't just look at the policy or the rules. So policies are basically rules which set incentives and allocate resources. And in, in, in institutional economics, we call rules institutions. So policies are part of, if you like, the institutional structure. And the political settlements framework says, you can't just look at the institutions without having a very good understanding of organizations. And the organizations are, if you like, the actors who are responding to those incentives, responding to those constraints, responding to those resources. And the organizations are, as we'll discuss, all kinds of things from firms and political parties, but also informal networks, patronage networks, tribal networks, all kinds of groups of people are organizations. And the political settlements framework says, you have to look at the power and the interests of organizations to understand how they're going to respond to those rules and how they might want to not just change those rules, but also distort those rules in, in their application. So that kind of understanding that you need to look at power and interests is not new. Lots of people say that. And actually, even people who work on political settlements often use power and interests in a way different from how I do it. So this introduction will be to expose you to this idea that the analysis of power is very complex. And this variable, if you, if you like the variable of organizational power has to be itself located inside a fairly complex analysis. Otherwise simplification can result in either very misleading analysis or a very superficial analysis, or eventually a wrong analysis. And my work on looking at organizations and their power, which is central to my analysis of political settlements, has four components, and I have written on it and others have written on it, but these four components are, firstly, you have to locate this issue of organizational power in a historical analysis of a social transformation. Countries are going through change all the time. And the way in which structures of society change is a historical analysis. In other words, you cannot look at governance without understanding history, without understanding where those structures came from and how they evolved because they've evolved in different ways in different countries. So the first part of my political settlements analysis is that it is based on a lot of historical understanding of how organizational power developed, how institutions developed. The second component of it is that it brings to the front the role of politically driven transfers, how power is used to allocate resources. In Marxist language, this is often called primitive accumulation, that is non-market strategies of transferring resources, whether land or subsidies or financial. When power is used to allocate resources, that's something different from what's happening in the market. And governance is essentially about this interaction between politics and economics. It's looking at how power is used to drive resource allocation and in, in neoclassical or, or conventional economic analysis, this process of politically driven transfers is called rents analysis. So I've written a lot about rents and rent seeking, in fact, books on it. And, and so that's a second component of a political settlements analysis. And the third thing is modern institutional economics, which looks at the debates about what kinds of institutions drive growth and efficiency. And as you know, there are huge debates here from Ashimoglu and Robinson type of you know, market enhancing governance institutions to my own work on other kinds of institutions that bring the first two things into play, how power is used in carrying out the social transformation. And the fourth part of it are sector studies, which are based on statistical analysis to understand how sectors are responding to policies and how they are changing. So political settlements analysis brings together a lot of different bits. It's not just a simple analysis saying, you know, let's describe power and then we can talk about how change happens or how institutions work. Nevertheless, the core element of political settlements analysis is an understanding of configurations of power. Understanding that is properly is our starting point. 
Because if you have a very simple interpretation of power and interests mean, as I said earlier, your analysis can become very trivial. Your analysis could become what actually political settlements is not saying, but a very simplistic interpretation might be that to analyze governance, and some people who actually talk about political settlements have this very simplistic understanding. They say, well, we need to identify who the powerful are in a society. We need to see how they agree with each other. That's the settlement as they understand it. Can they reach an agreement about how to distribute resources amongst themselves? Once that happens, then this group of powerful, which becomes a dominant coalition, will pass laws in their own interests and they will implement it. And that's how these societies develop. So if you want to change things, you have to work out who, what is the political settlement in this very narrow sense, the agreement between the powerful, and work with that to achieve change. You will find some people whose understanding of political settlements is that. And I'm the originator of this idea of political settlements, and I'm saying this is a misunderstanding. This is a very superficial understanding of what is the role of power and interests in driving governance and driving policy. The reason why it's very trivial is because actually the powerful are divided and they're always competing with each other. If you look at the powerful in the US, if you look at how Republicans and Democrats are fighting or how the powerful in South Africa are fighting, the idea that there is a pact between the powerful is an extremely misleading one. The powerful in no society agrees about how to share the rents. They are contesting amongst themselves. And the second problem is that who are the powerful is also at issue. The powerful are not the people sitting at the very top. If you're looking at how the health sector works or the education sector works or how um, schools work, the powerful at that level might be very different from the powerful at higher levels of society. But those people who are powerful at that level might be blocking things in, in their own interest and in their own way. And so looking at a political settlement as the powerful with an agreement is an extremely misleading way of thinking about how governance happens in different countries and sectors. So my approach to power and interest is different. My approach to political settlements, that's the abbreviation PS, is different. The way I look at power and interest is that any policy, any set of new rules that you create about incentives and allocation <clears throat> will change the costs and benefits for different organizations. Some will benefit and others will lose. And they're not necessarily the most powerful in society. The losers and gainers might be intermediate level. And that's the most important level in society is the intermediate level because that's where the action is. And these networks and coalitions will mobilize in response to that policy because they want to protect their benefits. They want to protect their rents. Rents in economics simply means these policy-induced transfers of resources. That's what rents mean. It's not house rent. Now, <clears throat> So the outcome of that process of rent seeking or competition or politics where different interests are mobilizing in response to a policy is my political settlements analysis. It doesn't really matter whether the top people have an agreement or not. The real action is at the level of the policy domain in which we are looking at how policy is implemented. What are the power capabilities and interests? And these are the three critical things which is why sometimes I call this a PCI approach, the power capabilities and interests approach. How are these different actors likely to respond to that policy? Once we have a framework which can begin to assess their likely responses, we can start to actually begin to predict what chance this policy has in terms of being actually implemented and achieving the results that we want to achieve. And it can help us <clears throat> develop testable hypotheses which we can then test experimentally or with administrative data. So that's the final stage in the analysis. So let's return to what is my way of thinking about this political settlement. Um, I define a political settlement as the distribution of power and capabilities across relevant organizations in a specific policy domain. So depending on the policy, we might be looking at a country level, we could be looking at a sector level, we could be looking at a village, or we could be looking at the whole world. So if the policy is, let's say, trade policy or intellectual property rights, 
Then you have to look at the distribution of power at the global level, who are the big pharmaceutical companies, the big financial companies, and so on. But you don't need to look at everything for every problem. So depending on your problem, you will be focusing on a specific set of actors. Those are the organizations of interest in that policy domain. So that's what policy domain means. Organizations are groups of individuals who are collectively working to achieve specific objectives. So in a sense, political settlements approach is really a collective action analysis, right? It's looking at how groups work together to achieve certain objectives. These organizations can be formal. Formal means they have rules which they can formally enforce legally on, on their members. So a firm in the US is a formal organization. It has rules and people who join the firm are bound by those legal rules. But the most important organizations in developing countries are actually informal organizations. They're networks. They're cross-cutting linkages of people who know each other and who work together on some things and work with other organizations on other things. And understanding these informal networks in developing countries is super important. In fact, a lot of my work on political settlements began with looking at how informal organizations in politics work in, in Bangladesh and Pakistan and South Asia and how they were different from the ones that were working in East Asia. And you can explain a lot by looking at the, the different configurations of power in these informal uh, organizations. Organizations are also different in terms of their productive capabilities. So some organizations make money by producing things, right? They, so they bring together people who can make buckets or make aeroplanes. And those organizations have, their interest is how to make more buckets or more aeroplanes or get subsidies to make them or whatever. So productive organizations have a certain agenda which is driven by their capabilities. But a lot of powerful organizations, particularly in developing and emerging countries have unproductive capabilities. There are networks who have the power to extract resources from others, which sounds very ugly, but actually that's, not necessarily, I mean, it could actually be very um, progressive in a sense, because a lot of these networks are networks of lower middle classes and intermediate classes who are organizing through politics to access resources. What the capabilities of an organization or a network is determines their interests, determines what they want to achieve in their rent seeking. And these networks and organizations have different levels of power and in this context, power is defined as holding power. Holding power is when two organizations are in a contest, the one that can hold out longer in that contest is likely to win. So if you think of a union and a firm, and the union is on strike, as long as that conflict continues, both sides are paying a price. Both sides are losing, right? The, the side that can hold out longer is likely to win. So if the union can hold, hold up for longer, it wins. If they give up because they give up, then the, the firm wins. So the holding power, and I'm gonna to come to what constitutes holding power in a second, is a critical concept in understanding these rent-seeking conflicts between different networks who are not necessarily always in, on, on strike or, or, or whatever, but those conflicts can range from spending money to in lobbying or taking people out during elections to vote, that might be a holding power. Two, at the other extreme, civil war and the capacity to fight with guns, right? So the, the rent seeking process has a whole range of activities, some from completely legal and, and moderate to completely illegal and violent. And all of this in, in a general sense is really about organizations protecting their interests. So the political settlements analysis says, how the organizations in that policy domain are organized, what their capabilities are, what their power is, and how they are responding to that tells you a lot about what rules can be enforced to what extent, and therefore what is the outcome. So, so the starting point therefore is we need to identify what are those formal and informal organizations. And you will be amazed that many people in developing countries don't even know what the formal and informal organizations of relevance to their problem is in their own country. 
is not something that we think about and not something we are taught about. And it's not something it's easy to go to the library and pick up some books about because we haven't really thought about things in that way. And then even more so, we need to have some way of assessing their powers and capabilities by looking at their historical actions. So from the historical actions of the history of conflicts and the history of how policies have emerged, we can begin to piece together a story about their relative power and the configuration of power in that society. This is the starting point. And this is a lot of homework because you don't find it ready-made sitting in an article somewhere. So how do we start mapping the organizational power of all these organizations which are contesting about policies? Sometimes holding power is based on economic power. My organization has power because I can mobilize money. I can control resources. So a lot of mainstream analysis, Engelman, Sokolov, Achimoglu, Johnson, and Robinson, who write about power, look at the economic power of different organizations. And interestingly, actually, that's also Marx. Marx was talking about why capital has, you know, why the state, in his famous um, uh, words, is the, you know, um, committee of the of the bourgeoisie, Lenin, uh, ditto, is is exactly this argument that because of economic power, you have political power, you have organized, you have, you have the power, the holding power to win in um, contests, and therefore policies reflect your interests. But actually, beyond economic power. Sometimes organizational power is also extremely important. Your holding power might depend on how you can mobilize people and fight more effectively than other organizations. Marx, again, interestingly, recognized the importance of class for itself as opposed to class in itself. I'm, I'm not gonna go into all these debates, but actually this idea of power comes from your ability to organize. You can go back to the classics and you find it, but in Marx, Marx was looking really at how class organizations might be well-organized or not well-organized. But most of the important network organizations that we find in developing countries are multi-class informal organizations, right? So if you think of you know, big political parties and movements in developing countries, they're multi-class. And, 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 and they're pyramids where different layers get different benefits if their group wins, right? And organizational power is extremely important in determining which groups win. And, that, and this is one reason why religion, tribe, caste, and ethnicity are really important in, in developing country politics. And increasingly now in advanced country politics, that's another issue, uh, I might come back to that, is because you need to organize your group and you need to fight for, for, for rents. And if you can have a simple label to organize around, you have a lot of organizational power. Power might also be based on ideological power. The, the belief that your fight is a just fight. That enables you to accept a lot of costs of the conflict, right? And so ideological power and organizational power can sometimes trump economic power. So if you want to have a very powerful image of this, think of the Americans fighting in Vietnam or indeed more recently in Afghanistan, the Americans had more economic power, so they had more holding power. They could inflict more costs on the other side with better weapons and bigger guns and night vision and so on. <laughs> but the other side, the communists in Vietnam or the Taliban in Afghanistan had better organizational power and stronger ideological power. They could take the pain for longer, they didn't give up. So whatever they were throwing at them, they were dying, but more were coming and joining. And ultimately, holding power of the weak in terms of economic power turned out to be stronger than the holding power of the, the group with the bigger economic power, right? So it's not the case that the richer always win. If they did, most conflicts would not happen because how rich someone is or what some group is is the easiest thing to measure. And if, if I knew that, I would lose a fight with someone with more money, I would never fight. But you do, and you fight because you know that actually there are other elements of power which are beyond just economics. Probably all of this is <laughs> obvious, but I, I needed to spell this out. Once you have mapped the different sources of power in, in your organizational um, configuration, the political settlements framework said, these configurations are relatively stable. This is very important. They're relatively stable. 
but they're actually always evolving. The groups that were powerful today will remain powerful tomorrow, but because of incremental changes, 10 years later, the configuration of power might be quite different, right? So time is really important in understanding the stability of configurations of power. And this is, again, very different from this idea that a political settlement is some kind of agreement or pact. If you think of a political settlement as a description of a distribution of power, the political settlement is always evolved. And it doesn't matter whether you have an agreement or not. The real political settlement is the real distribution of power, regardless of whether you agree about it or not. So here now we can start talking about some policy um, implications already. The more developed the country, the more diversified its economy, it's more likely to have many powerful organizations that are productive. This is just a definition of being more developed. The more the powerful organizations are productive, the more likely it is that their power is based on economic power, right? Because they generate lots of profits, they pay lots of taxes, they have a lot of money to lobby, they hire uh, lobbyists, they pay money to big media, right? So the big firms have power because they're productive, and they have economic power. Whereas the less developed the country and the, the more it's in this transformation phase, and remember that, that social transformation is a critical part of this understanding of political settlements, the more likely it is that powerful organizations actually have organizational power. Their power is based on organizational power. Their power comes from clientless networks, populist political parties, the ability to mobilize large numbers of people, not their ability to produce lots of profit because they're productive. And this basic fact, this basic economic fact explains a lot about the governance challenges of transitional countries. Right? And, and my point is that actually advanced countries, as power becomes more concentrated in advanced countries, they're beginning to acquire some of the features of developing countries where populist parties and populist politics are becoming more important. But I won't go into that now for reasons of time. But in general, the more advanced the country, the more broad-based the productive organizations, the more likely that the powerful mobilize to influence policies, right? So if you look at the UK or Netherlands or the US or whatever, the powerful do have massive influence in policy making. They pay more taxes, so governments listen to them. They have powerful lobbyists, they influence the media. But the way they influence policy is by making the policy. They, generally speaking, once the policy is made, they don't, if they don't like the policy, they don't just go out and evade the policy or distort it with corruption. That happens, but it happens a lot less. And my point is that there's, once you understand the distribution of power, you can begin to understand why it's a lot less. And the reason is that in any society, an individual organization wants to free ride, right? So if the rule is that people pay taxes and you have public goods, an individual organization might not want to pay that tax and free ride on others paying tax. So free riding is a universal incentive. But when most of your organizations are productive and those organizations need to have a rule following reputation because they need complex contracting to organize their productive activities, organize their finance, organize their transactions with each other, losing that reputation for being rule following is suicidal. So what you see in advanced countries is not that the reason why governance is stronger is not because they have better enforcement capacity or that they have cameras on every street or that everybody's tax is audited every year. Not at all, actually. It's simply that when a company or an individual violates tax rules, violates health and safety, violates financial rules and is caught, there is no escaping because if they don't apologize, pay the fine, and fire all the people within the organization who are doing these things, they lose their reputation of being rule following, and their whole business will collapse the next day. Right? So 
Goldman Sachs might want to free ride, and they do. But as soon as Goldman Sachs is detected, before their you know, punishment comes, they run to the court to pay the fine, which might be billions of dollars of fine. Because if they don't do that, and if they don't show that they're making restitution, if they lose their reputation of rule following behavior, they lose trillions of dollars of business, right? So it is pure interest, self-interest, that drives uh, the, the, the rule of law in advanced countries, the more advanced the country. So that's why advanced countries have what we describe as a rule of law, which simply means that you have rules. The rules are obviously influenced by the powerful. But once the rules are there, even the powerful get punished if they break the rules, right? So that's So the rule of law means that the violator doesn't get any special privileges because they're powerful. Now, this is, of course, a simplification. It's not exactly the case, but it is the case that if you look at how rules are enforced, the powerful are much more likely to get punished in a, in a country where the distribution of power is very broad-based than they are in a country where it is not. And the fundamental difference in development, so I, this is important to understand. The reason why I'm going through this very carefully is that people often say it's to do with culture, it's to do with you know, ethics, it's to do with... Actually, it's not. It's to do with the distribution of power and the self-interest of the power. That's what it has to do with, right? So in developing countries, if you have powerful organizations which have organizational power rather than productive power, then there's interest is less in implementing good policy and following the policy. They're more interested in capturing policy resources. And if they're detected, they don't actually care about making restitution, saying sorry, firing their people who were engaged in this and saying it will never happen again, they just continue. And the reason they continue is not because there is some impunity and we don't have good enforcement, is because actually other powerful organizations are not insisting that they get punished and they don't stop engaging with them because they have lost their rule following reputation. Because those other organizations are also not productive mostly, right? So if you think of it in a very crude way, if you're in a society with a few powerful organizations and they're all breaking rules, I know I'm a thief, you know I'm a thief, but we can still transact with each other because we have not many of us and I can enforce my contracts with you using informal ways of enforcement. So I'm buying your cement. If you don't deliver my cement, I'm not necessarily going to take you to court, right? I'm going to send someone on a motorbike to your office to see that you give me my cement. And that person might be a policeman, that might be a law enforcer, but they're going there because I have an informal relationship with them, I'm paying them, that's why they're going there. And you know that, so you won't cheat me. If you look at developing countries, that is how life happens. There are huge differences between them, but this is a common feature. A lot of enforcement is informal. And because a lot of enforcement is informal, the powerful don't need a general rule of law. They need to just make sure that their interests are protected. So what I describe this as is that developing countries and emerging countries and transitional countries have what I describe as rule by law. Rule by law means a lot of rules are enforced, but a lot of rules are not enforced. And it depends on who is violating it and when. So some people will have rules enforced on them and other people will not have rules enforced on them. And that is rule by law. So a lot of developing countries which look like they have very strong rule of law, actually, when you look at them, they actually have rule by law. So Rwanda, for example, has rule, very strong rule by law. China has very strong rule by law. It's very hard to imagine that Xi Jinping or some top brass in China will ever have to go to court to explain why some rules were not followed. Now, that's again, nothing to do with culture, politics, et cetera. It's to do with the distribution of power. And once you understand that, you actually have a very powerful way of saying, how do I start thinking of policy in a context where you have different variants of rule of law and some countries have much stronger rule by law and some countries have very weak rule by law, but very few transitional countries have, I mean, I would even say strong, they do not have a rule of law. And even in advanced countries which have a rule of law, it is backsliding in many cases and it's getting weaker. Okay. Now, the important point is that that general view hides many huge differences 
in the organization of power in developing countries. There are huge differences in political organizations. How many parties do you have? How disciplined are they? On what basis do they mobilize? How do they use informal networks and the ideology of caste and populism and tribe and ethnicity? Can higher levels control lower levels or is it really that they're losing control? All of those things determine the power of organizations and the networks within organizations that might be relevant for different kinds of policy. Economic organizations very hugely. How concentrated is the economic power in that sector? How many firms in that sector are globally competitive, which is a sign of how productive they are? How big is the informal sector? How does the informal networks operate? How are they connected to politicians? You need to have a good picture of how power is being organized. And similarly with bureaucratic organizations, are higher levels able to control lower levels? Is there clientelism in the appointment of bureaucrats? Are bureaucrats answerable to their political bosses rather than to the bureaucracy? How is power distributed across civilian, military, and non-governmental bureaucrats, which is very important in some countries, less important in South Africa? All of these differences in the distribution of power and capabilities matter at different levels, depending on what is the problem you are looking at. So let me now summarize how this looks like. You know, I'm, I've talked a, a lot about the, about the building blocks. Now I want to put the building blocks together and say, what does that mean for an analysis of a system or a society? So first of all, think of a number of organizations with different holding power. If these are all productive organizations, or, or most of these powerful organizations are productive organizations, then they will mobilize to create rules, institutions, and by the way, property rights are also rules. Property rights are rules about who can use an asset. Taxes are rules. You know, election, electoral rules are rules. If productive organizations dominate, they will construct a set of formal rules, because remember that Productive organizations need a rule of law in their own interest because contracting is really important for them. But those institutions will protect their interests. So the powerful will create property rights that are aligned with their interest. Those institutions will support a distribution of net benefits that reproduces that power, right? So the powerful create institutions. Those institutions are formal institutions. They distribute benefits across these organizations and that then reproduces their power and then you have an equilibrium and this is why political settlements are very difficult to change the distribution of power is reinforced by institutions institutions and organizations interact they're interdependent you cannot look at one without the other and this is the big mistake people say you know what policy will work without asking what are the organizations that i'm trying to use the policy on and that obvious error is so widespread that I'm, I'm sometimes baffled why people don't get it. Now, the important thing is that as soon as you have informal organizations or organizations of low productive capability, this story becomes even more complicated, massively more complicated. Because now, if you have a lot of informal organizations, they're creating informal institutions, informal rules, patronage structures, corruption structures, clientless structures, and those informal rules then direct resources to those informal organizations. So instead of a circle from A to C, you now have a circle from B to C, right? So the informal institutions reinforce the informal organizations. And again, you have an equilibrium. But now the equilibrium is a mix of formal and informal organizations and a mix of formal and informal rules. So some rules are formal, they're enforced, and some rules are violated. And which rules are violated depends on who those powerful organizations are informally who are violating them. And again, you have an equilibrium. Now, if you look at the typical developing country, it's an equilibrium like that. It's not a simple equilibrium where you can just look at the formal institutions. You really need to understand all the hidden ways in which resources are being allocated. And this is not trivial. It is not trivial. I mean, the 
bulk of activity actually might be these informal transfers, informal rules, informal ways of allocating resources. So here is another diagram which is saying the same thing, but in a neater way. The neater way of looking at it is that the political settlement focuses attention on this interaction between organizations and institutions. It's saying, start with the distribution of power and capabilities on the organizational side. That's the political settlement, okay? So the political settlement is those colored dots, the organization. Some of them are more powerful, some of them are less powerful. Those organizations are driving rules and their implementation, and that's the policies you get on the institutional side. You have the rules, policies, constitutions, et cetera. But the organizations are not just driving what institutions emerge, they're also driving, and this is the really important part of developing countries, how those institutions are distorted in practice. Because remember that informal organizations get their access to resources informally. They have to work around those formal institutions with corruption, clientelism, and different kinds of patronage. So you have the bottom green arrow back from the institutions, both formal and informal, which are now reproducing the power of organizations, right? This equilibrium is the political settlement, but the main comp component of the political settlement is the distribution of power across organizations. And see that none of this is based on any kind of agreement or pact between the powerful. It depends on what organizations you're looking at and what institutions you're looking at. You're trying to search for that configuration, that equilibrium that policy has to now attack. How, do, how does policy upset this equilibrium? That is the question. If you don't understand the equilibrium, you might go in head first and get kicked out, right? Because you really haven't understood how the players are playing this game. So this is a, a changing story. It's an evolving story, but at any moment in time, there is a pattern here, there is an equilibrium. Here. And that equilibrium is our starting point of analysis. And this is the historical part of the analysis. This is not, you, you will not get this without looking at the history of how your organizations and institutions have evolved over the last century or, or, or more. Now we come to the process of change. How does change happen? Change happens in the political settlements view incrementally. It happens in an evolutionary way. So economic and political opportunities are continuously changing. The Chinese might come to your country to invest, or the Chinese might leave your country because they're no longer interested, or there might be a global crisis, or there might be a new market that you're suddenly selling your um, iron ore to. Now, those changes in economic and political opportunities create space for new organizations. It creates space for those new organizations to seek changes in rules, formal and informal, which then reinforces their power. And as they do it, the overall distribution of power in society is incrementally changing. And that sets up an evolutionary process, which, and that evolutionary process could go in an inclusive direction, <laughs> by which I mean that the distribution of power becomes broader and more productive, and productive organizations become more powerful. But this evolutionary process can also be regressive. It can actually make extractive or organizationally powerful, populist organizations more powerful, and the base of productive activity might remain narrowly based. This is the space in which policy intervention happens. And it's really important in terms of the debate between structure and agency. A lot of people criticize the political settlement approach as a structuralist approach. They say, it's actually saying, things are already fixed by the distribution of power, there's nothing we can do. But actually, the political settlements approach does not privilege structure. It is saying that agency and structure are always interacting, and this critique that it is deterministic is just plain wrong. They haven't understood what the, the framework is trying to do. However, what it is saying is that adventurism is a mistake. You cannot, you cannot have an intervention that doesn't understand this interplay between politics, be, between organizations and institutions, because if you do, if you, if you throw that stone into that hornet's nest without understanding how the hornets are, are buzzing inside, 
not only will you not achieve your objective, you might end up dead, okay? So not all interventions are likely to work. Some are likely to fail, and some of them are likely to be more than just fail. They're likely to hurt the people you are trying to help by having repression on them and, and police opening fire and picking people up and killing, which is actually not at all an exaggeration if you live in developing countries, and I'm sitting in one myself. So the point of a political settlements analysis is to reduce disappointment and reduce massive failures by understanding the challenges and focusing on what is possible rather than imagining that anything is possible, right? And once you understand what is possible, okay, here is an opportunity with new opportunities, new political opportunities. What combination of organizations and institutions will actually embed a progressive change? How do we get to a better outcome? That's the political settlements policy framework. So let me end with three quick diagrams which shows how thinking has evolved and how the political settlements thinking helps us to think about policy in a more nuanced and, and useful way. The simple way of thinking about policy, economics 101 or governance 101, is you have a number of organizations, A, B, and C, and the policy is trying to change their behavior to improve the outcome. So let's say you have three firms, A, B, and C, and they're polluting a lot, and you have a bad outcome, how does policy change their incentives so that they pollute less? I'm giving a very trivial example of policy. So policy then seeks, says, we can try and change this organizational behavior with regulations, taxes, subsidies, to try and get people to pollute less. You have your taxes and subsidies, and then you find that nothing changes in the outcome because A, B, and C are you know, not paying the tax or bribing the tax collector or taking the subsidy to cut back their emissions and not cutting their emissions, they're capturing the rents by informally distorting the policy and then the outcome is not achieved. I mean, this is a really common outcome in transitional societies. So it's not just about simple things like environment, well, simple, I'm saying, but it's, at least with environmental policy, you know what is you're trying to achieve is it's relatively simple. But think of industrial policy. <clears throat> how many industrial policies in how many developing countries have used industrial development banks, direct protection, export subsidies, policy rents to A, B, and C to finance new technologies, to enable learning by doing? But in many cases, they have just taken this and not developed, maybe sent the money outside, maybe bought themselves nice houses and cars, but the outcome of a more productive society with more jobs, with more employment, has often not been achieved. So this is step one. This is how the thinking about governance began from Economics 101, not achieving the results it was seeking to achieve. Then comes stage two, and the thinking said, okay, let's introduce another organization, which is government or governance agencies. So when you, once you have a policy and you're giving subsidies to A, B, and C, and they're taking this policy and free riding, or they're fighting each other about the rents, or you, you can't enforce it, what you need is good agencies that are going to enforce the rules on these players. This is the beginning of the discussion on governance. And there are two variants of it, and the simple variants are both wrong. One variant of it comes from developmental state theorists. And developmental state theorists say, if you are giving subsidies for industrial policy, you need to have a state which can enforce discipline where the leaders have vision and they have to have a Weberian or impartial rule enforcement. But what if you can't because A, B, and C are powerful and they make collusion, uh, collusive arrangements with your own governance agencies and you can't enforce it? So a lot of you know, um, industrial policy failed in countries which were actually led by leaders who wanted to change things, who used a lot of force, were quite authoritarian, tried to impose discipline, and nevertheless failed. My PhD began by looking at the example of comparing South Korea and Pakistan in the 1960s, where the leadership and the instruments that they were used were almost identical, 
And by some accounts, these South Koreans came to Pakistan to learn about industrial policy. The difference was that the South Koreans enforced the industrial policy and the Pakistanis, despite trying again and again, failed. Now that history, I, I don't have time to go into, but I've written about it. You can find it in my writings and we can talk about it later. On the other side of the discussion were liberal theorists and liberal theorists came up with this idea of good governance. And the good governance was that actually, if you can get a rule of law going, have strong anti-corruption, if you can enforce property rights, if you achieve political stability, then A, B, and C will not be able to free right because you can punish them by taking them to court. And a lot of my early work was criticizing this whole good governance theory to saying, this is just not asking the fundamental question, who is going to enforce the good governance? So it's, it's just adding another complexity to this problem without having an answer. And again, a lot of resources were spent in the 1980s and 90s on good governance reforms, improving the rule of law, anti-corruption agencies, property rights investments. Result, almost negligible. So both these approaches of trying to solve this problem by, in, by strengthening some conception of governance without looking at the self-interest of the organizations didn't go very far. Then comes political settlement story. Right? Political settlement says, you have to begin by looking at the interactions between these organizations, how those organizations are interacting with the institutions, how they are rent seeking to capture the rents. And only then can you design the policy. So the design of the policy becomes critical. And the policy design has to be such that some coalition of A, B, and C in their own interest will want that policy to be implemented and will support the governance agencies to implement that policy. And only then will you get that outcome. In other words, you need to have a very good understanding of the relative power and capabilities of A, B, and C and the governance agencies and how they are interacting in the equilibrium that I described earlier, the equilibrium that you want to break. And you have to find a policy design that actually splits that equilibrium. And if you can't find a policy that splits that equilibrium, you should just move away from this problem because actually there might be no solution at, the, at this moment. A solution might emerge as the distribution of power in that society changes. So this is the beginning of the political settlements analysis with its emphasis on horizontal activity between the actors to start to enforce or subvert the rules for which you need to understand the initial power and capabilities and the power of governance agencies and their capabilities. And the critical point now is that policy design matters because it has to be designed for this political settlement not copied from China, Korea, the United States, or the UK, but designed for this political setting. Now, an example of this is that if you compare industrial policy in the 1960s, the industrial policy that, that, was, that emerged in the 1960s was very simplistic. It basically said, let's give funds to firms and I call that ex ante rents because you're giving the resources before they have become productive. And then you're saying, if you don't become productive, we will take this away from you, okay? Now, the distribution of power in South Korea was such that the firms that didn't become productive, the governance agencies could take those resources away from them. And so they had very strong incentives to actually raise their productivity. But in Pakistan, India, and many other developing countries, once you gave the firms the subsidy, they used that to change the implementation of rules and created an equilibrium where it was impossible for anyone to take that subsidy away. And that was not because the, the, you know, the president didn't have nationalist intentions or didn't have um, a lot of enforcement power. It's because no amount of enforcement power is going to crack the kind of interlocking interests of lots of organizations locking themselves up in an equilibrium. So the real difference between South Korea and South Asia, and this was my PhD thesis and the whole political settlement story started with that, was not in the enforcement capacity, was that South Korea by accident had a political settlement that was quite good for this industrial policy. But then something really interesting happens in the 1980s in South Asia. 
that different structures of industrial policy emerge, which reduce the risks in the learning processes. But these industrial policies were based on creating incentives for A, B, and C to engage in that learning by not giving them resources upfront, but linking the resource to outcomes that they achieve. I don't have time to go into this, but my work on the Bangladeshi garments industry, the Indian automobiles industry, and the pharma industry shows how a new kind of industrialization happened where the policy actually cracked the collusive behavior of the players in, in uh, specific sectors and allowed the actors themselves in their self-interest to use these resources for raising productivity. So this is a, an example of how policy design becomes critical, not just trying to say, here's a policy that worked in Taiwan. Now let us try to construct the distribution of power that made it work in Taiwan. That's impossible. You are not going to change your distribution of power. The real question is, how did they create incentives? Why will it not work here? What can we do in terms of creating the policy incentives in a way that is self-enforcing based on the interests of the players themselves and the ways in which they informally try to play the system? We, we need to understand that. And once you do that, actually, there are lots of things you can do. So to sum up, what I'm saying is that thinking of power and interest in this way is more complex than simply thinking of it as an agreement between the powerful. The way I think of political settlements is that it's a configuration of power which cuts across all levels of a society, affects policy choice and implementation. And if you want to end with some metaphors, the idea that the powerful sit together and have an agreement. The metaphor is that you have a house and the powerful sit on the top floor and the powerful sit and agree about what policies to do, which are in their own interest. And if they can agree on this, they can decide these policies and impose it. So the pack view is, is one where the top floor of the house matters. The configuration view is much more complex. It's saying that Houses are complex and different societies have different kinds of houses and history has built these houses with different structures of rooms, different corridors, different alleyways and coalitions cut across all these rooms and floors in complex ways. And there is no simple way through this house to get to your objective. And the way you can get through this house is by really understanding it's how the rooms and the people within it and the coalitions are configured and finding ways of cracking these coalitions so that paths are cleared for you to go from point A to point B. This is just a metaphor, but it shows that thinking of power as some kind of agreement between the powerful is far too simplistic and not very useful. So the political settlements um, work has two stages. The first was inductive. And a lot of my earlier work was inductive. And inductive means that you look at historical patterns, you look at you know, what might be the configuration of power in China and what was the outcome in China, what was it in India, what was in Pakistan, what happened in, in Nigeria, what happened in Tanzania. And those patterns, you use that to construct a story about how configurations of power are related to specific outcomes, specific successes or specific failures. This is interesting, and that's how you develop the framework. But this framework simply tells you that this configuration view of power is important. It doesn't tell you what to do about it, right? So from the inductive stage, which is really important and is more historical case study and so on, you have to move to what economists and, and social scientists call the deductive phase. The deductive phase is now we have a framework for looking at how these variables interact. You use this knowledge to identify testable hypotheses and say, you know, this instrument is likely to work in this context. Let's go and collect administrative data and ultimately policy experiments to test if that is true. And my work is now increasingly shifting from the inductive stage to the deductive stage. And at the beginning, Faisal said, we have this anti-corruption evidence research program. And this is basically saying that most anti-corruption has failed 
because it didn't understand the distribution of power in societies. It didn't understand that the Anti-Corruption Commission has no incentive in taking on powerful people in your society. And the Anti-Corruption Commission itself is corrupt in most developing countries. And that, that's not the way in which you are going to solve this problem. But if you look at anti-corruption as a way of creating checks and balances between actors, so that in their own interest, they start checking each other in this complex configuration way, then you have testable hypothesis that this instrument will work here. And the interesting thing is we are doing that, right? So we have lots of papers now published in, in very good journals, peer reviewed, all of that, where we have shown that the political settlements framework can generate testable hypotheses and the evidence can support it. And this is really important for people who are doing heterodox work or non-mainstream work, because one of the main strengths of the mainstream was that, you know, this is all case study, it's inductive, but you, you haven't tested it deductively. You haven't got a falsifiable hypothesis, which you take and test with the data. And I think people who are working with political economy in these heterodox ways, we need to generate falsifiable hypotheses to show that actually the data supports it, that this is evidence-based. You know, this is a hypothesis. I don't know if it's true or not. Let's go and see it's true, if it's true. That's the deductive phase. And so this is really exciting and we are at that point now. So I think I've spoken a little longer than I wanted to, but I think there's some time left Faisal, for a, a discussion. I have a lot of um, um, publications and research both on the anti-corruption evidence website. So you can go and um, look for that in by, by searching for SOAS ACE, ACE, anti-corruption evidence. Um, or you can also look at Mushtaq Khan SOAS and find my university website and most of my publications are up. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Mustach for that uh, really, um, I think, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> rational, very systematic <laughs> process of taking us through the concepts and um, delving into the academic literature and, uh, and then um, helping us understand how you came to develop these concepts of uh, political settlement and what you understand by it, and uh, as you indicated, there are others that may also write about political settlements, but perhaps not um, nuanced in the way that 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 you have. So what I'm struck by, Musta, is that really what you you're doing is you're developing a, um, if, you call, uh, if you like, a very not just a, um, a, an analytical framework that uh, speaks to different interests. Uh, and, and tries to explain the configuration of power uh, as a starting point in, in any analysis of um, um, governance challenges. Uh, <clears throat> but you, you're also introducing the element of um, struggle, if you like, tension, and how actors in society can um, you know, develop agency uh, and engage so what I didn't see is the role of um, leadership. You know, uh, so what you describe when you when you look at you know the compacts um, is uh, as a negotiator, for example. You know, when I you know teach now students about negotiations, I I say that even before you've understood fully your own interests, what are your own interests? You should understand the interests of the other side. What is it they want? What are the configuration of you know, institutions in that country or that economy, if it's a bilateral negotiation, that um, you know, um, uh, uh, exists? And um, how might your you know, interests in your country, the configuration, you know, converge? What are the points of convergence and work from there? <laughs> um, but it does require leadership. It requires a facilitator. It requires someone to do that anal analysis and then bring the parties together. And then, of course, through facilitation, persuade them that it's in their own best interest, all parties concerned, 
to find this kind of sweet spot, this point of convergence. Um, and you arguing that uh, also, if you take that at the sort of maybe sectoral level or even at the firm level, if you're engaging that firm and you want to persuade them to pursue a particular um, course of action, to, in other words, to implement a certain type of policy, whether that's about environment or that's about you know, building more productive or more competitive um, industrial capabilities, um, and you're giving them some incentive, you need to also, if you want to make sure that they, they comply, uh, you want to add some uh, reciprocal obligations. What are they going to do? And so you kind of link the two up, but you, you link it in a way which uh, allows the, 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 the particular firm or, uh, or company or industry uh, to meet those obligations. It must be something that can be met uh, because if it isn't, they'll find a way <laughs> of, 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 uh, of not implementing or, or um, um, of, of defying the policy, but you need to find a way of um, getting them to agree that it's in their best interest to comply, um, but add some reciprocal obligations, you know, on their part. Uh, so it's sort of a win-win. You're looking for the win-win, the sweet spot, whether it is, you know, at the sort of a uh, compact at the national level or at the specific level. But what you haven't told us, you know, so what I'm looking for, so the same with, you know, corruption and institutions, and how, you know, how do we get those institutions to work? Is what's the role of leadership? How, where's the agency? So how do we actually bring about those changes that you're talking about? Who does it? Um, so, so that's my question, because uh, you, from the way you've described your analytical frame, it really helps us to understand better the range of uh, uh, forces um, the, the, the players um, or organizational powers, you describe it, uh, but how do we change it? So that, that's my question, but uh, I mean, I'm gonna encourage people to please put your questions in the chat or just put your hand up and I'll allow you to, um, to introduce yourself and ask the question directly to Professor Mustaf Khan. Mustaf? Yeah, so I, I think that you, you talked about interests, Faisal, but you didn't talk about power. And I think that's the critical part of the political settlement story is power. Now, when you say win-win and you have reciprocal obligations, that's fine, but you have to ask the question, what happens if someone does not comply? What can I do if they don't comply? What is my holding power? Right. Do I have power to fight back? Now, the point with the old industrial policy was that it was a reciprocal um, arrangement. Firms got subsidies. They were supposed to deliver exports or jobs or whatever. And it was clear that if they didn't, they would lose the subsidy. The point is that the distribution of power between the firm and the political actors in South Korea allowed that to happen. Whereas in the much more clientless and fragmented quality of South Asia, the firms could make alliances with networks within the ruling party, within the army, within the bureaucracy, so that the planning minister or the president could not withdraw the subsidy. In other words, it, they, they ignored the problem of enforceability, which comes from holding power. That was the fundamental problem. No? So, so the issue is that um, if, if you have to design a, a reciprocal industrial policy, you have to ask yourself, what happens if the other side free rides? If the other side takes the resource and doesn't? So mm. that's not an agreement. That's about enforcement. So why did the, the, the pharmaceutical industry or the auto industry or the garments industry work um, in the 80s? So we had to wait to the 1980s and 90s in South Asia for any kind of industrial takeoff. And it was again, trial and error and accident is because now the technology came from a foreign company, the local company would only benefit after it had acquired the capability to start exporting or becoming globally competitive. And the government allowed a contract to happen 
which would give the foreign company a big payoff after the domestic company had a takeoff. I'm generalizing. Now think of how, there's no way you can free ride on this, right? Because if the domestic company wants to make money, it has to raise its productivity because there's no upfront money which it can capture and use its networks to protect. If the foreign company doesn't transfer technology to the domestic company, it is actually not going to get the profits or the kickback from the, the government. So in a sense, what I'm saying is that when you design your policy, ask yourself what you will do if one of the critical actors says, I'm going fishing, right? What is your, what is your comeback? That comeback is the real political settlement. You can sit and have an agreement, but the role of political leadership is not to have an agreement, which can be broken the next day, is to actually figure out the real power of the actors. And then when you design the policy, you don't even have to have an agreement, they will actually behave because they know how. So to give you a really painful example of this, you know, when Ethiopia began its um, developmental state strategy, and we were, you know, from SOAS actually quite heavily involved in advising the Ethiopian uh, ministries and so on on, on development um, strategy. And I was one of the people who kept saying that, do not compare yourself with the South Korean developmental state, right? You are a completely different developmental state. And the one thing that is fundamentally different between South Korea and Ethiopia is that power is regionalized and this regionalized power is subsumed under a lot of hidden um, networks. And if you try to superimpose a central industrial policy on it, the regional power balance will explode. I actually said this, you know, 10 years ago. And I'm absolutely not happy that I was proved right. I'm dis dis depressed and disappointed. But I think the failure of leadership in Ethiopia was not understanding that configuration of power and not taking steps of um, decentralizing their industrial policy so that the networks at the um, regional level, the Oromos and others, and you know, had a stake in that industrial policy. And that would mean that eventually the, the ruling coalition would get diluted, they would lose their control, but it also meant that the country might not have exploded in the way that it did, right? So the task of leadership is really to have a very prosaic and pragmatic and practical historical understanding of power, and then doing things in the way that you maneuver around these rooms in your house. Your house was constructed for you 100 years ago, right? You are stuck with that. Now you have to find a way of moving through those rooms, not stepping on these sleeping tigers and sleeping coalitions, but also finding a way that once they wake up, they will start, at least some of them will start supporting you in their own interest because they get some benefit from this industrial development. Now mm. you look at what the Ethiopians did, their industrial policy was based on foreign investment, centralization, and completely ignoring the middle. And the middle struck back. So, yeah. so leadership is about having that really good understanding of your history and your politics. And the tragedy is that the Ethiopian leadership did have it, but they didn't have, they didn't take I, I mean, I don't want to say this, but I, I, I feel that they should have had the courage to actually let go a lot earlier and decentralize power. And keeping power, you know, so centralized power works in some political settlements. Centralized power does not work in other political settlements. So to try and emulate a very centralized South Korean style of power, when you have a lot of ethnic divisions in your country, is not understanding your political settlement. So this is an example. So whether it is in terms of the big picture of industrial policy or the design of, of um, interventions, the point of leadership is getting our leaders to understand the scenarios of how the powerful might respond and react to their policies and then be prepared for each scenario. And then actually come up with, an, with, with, with a suggestion that enough of these interests will respond to in their own self-interest and will follow in their own self-interest. That's the critical thing. So interest is important, but so is power. And right. we often know this issue of power. And I think that's where the problem is. And the configuration of power is very different across countries, but even 
across regions in, in a country. I mean, different parts of South Africa might have very different configurations of power and capabilities. And so a South African leader would really need to be cognizant of that to design this conversation. Great. No, thank you so much, Bustar. That's a very uh, valuable insight. Um, uh, let me uh, let me ask um, uh, Muhammad Ali. I saw your hand up. Do you still want to say something? Please uh, go ahead, introduce yourself, and ask your question. Yes. Good afternoon, Professor Mishtaq Khan, and also Professor Ismail uh, Muhammad Ali. I'm a student of uh, pop, I mean Masters in Development Policy and Practice at uh, UCT, Nelson Mandela School of Governance. I'm now joining you from Nairobi, Kenya. It's glad that uh, Professor Mushtaq, I have read some of your literature, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I met you today. I'm in person on that I'm asking you some question, questions. Actually, the session was uh, very good, and I would like that uh, I, I ask, and I, I pledge that uh, Professor Ismail to maybe to give us one more in the, the course of the year. So I have two issues. One is what we call about uh, issues that's happening in the powerful, uh, uh, what you call powers and immunities issues we have in, in the developed world and also in the developing world. Uh, so what I've discovered that is in, in the, in what, when you're talking about power in the developed, in the developed world, it's what you call, uh, you mentioned a role of uh, reputation that uh, if you do these things and then uh, if you don't apologize or maybe don't do anything, the miracle will happen the next day. But in Africa or maybe where we come, where I come from, these things are different, people, people move with immunity. And actually the criminals now are joining the government to have protections. So uh, what? but still those countries with, uh, which have that high of rural reputation are assisting our governments and they're keeping uh, those people who are now moving, moving with immunity in the system. So what incentive is uh, in place so that we shake this, you know, with this kind of painful scenarios uh, where we having people who have repetitions and maybe who are, who are considering issues of fairness and uh, are now uh, supporting and holding in power the same people who are, who, who are criminals. That's my first question. My second question is, uh, you mentioned issues of uh, of uh, that uh, what you call policy instruments that work for maybe South Africa does not work maybe in Botswana or maybe work for Kenya or maybe doesn't work for Ethiopia. Uh, most of our countries uh, we are getting you know budget support and we are getting support from you know, developed world and I mean maybe developed you know institutions like World Bank and IMF. Uh, those advisors who are advising our, 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 our governments are not from uh, maybe from maybe Kenya, they are from uh, what do you call, they are from America and then or maybe South Korea. And this kind of development fashion is not the same we have here, but still they are advisors, they are injecting money in our countries, and at the end of the day we are not receiving anything. So uh, wh why is this happening? Uh, why can't we have uh, someone who have who have the same, who have, who, have, who have passed the same route is going to advise the government instead of giving someone who maybe who grew up in maybe a chocolate or something else. That is my second question. My last question is, is there a relationship between the foreign policy of a country and the political settlement within that country? Because most of the countries in, our, in our Africa are supported. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Mahmoud Ali. I mean, that was a lot. Let, but I'll have to give you, unfortunately, brief answers. On, the, on your first question is exactly what I'm, what I'm saying, right? So it's not just in Africa. If you look at Asia, if you look at the developing world, organizational power <clears throat> is a source of power. And if you want to organize these powerful networks, you have to have access to illicit funds. It's as simple as that. So the reason why criminals are more likely to go to parliament is because they have the greater capacity to organize organizations, and that's important in terms of getting power. How do you fight that? Is a, unfortunately it's a long-term thing, you know. So you have to understand that this process of changes in the political settlement takes decades. So the the West Western countries have only become you know, reasonably tolerable in the last 
century. I mean, there was a long history of many, many centuries when they were much worse than African countries in terms of violations of rules and violence. I mean, the Second World War was a conflagration of the scale of which no African country has witnessed and let's hope they never witness, right? So Europe was a very violent and, and conflictual place still very recently, I mean, often, almost in living memory. So, 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 so I think we have to be prepared for a long haul. How do you get out of that? Is this incremental way? So to me, the way you create more checks and balances in society, which is the way of actually having a more civilized, decent society with greater and greater checks and balances and rule of law is by creating more productive capabilities in more sectors and, and in more regions of your country. Now, that is something that we can, we can do even with our bad governance and with the criminals in politics, right? So you don't, so, but if you say that we have to first get the criminals out of politics, I would say that's pretty hopeless task because how, I mean, I'm not clear what that agenda would mean in terms of your holding power against their holding power. You have very little holding power. But what you can do is you can construct policies that at least some of these people who are making money will become more productive, will actually create jobs, and that over a period of decades will create the kind of broad-based economy where criminality becomes less and less and less of a strategy of getting to parliament and having policies that drive the productive sector, because now the productive sector will be spending money to elect politicians that it wants. So they will still be trying to buy influence, but they will be trying to buy influence in a more rule following way. And to me, that's better. That's better because at least we know what policies they're supporting and we can have a public debate about those policies. So there is a, there is a way out of this. There is a long and incremental way. And it's the way that, by the way, all countries have followed. And countries which tried to change things very rapidly usually ended up back in square one very quickly. Just think of what has been happening in countries with the Arab Spring and so on. You know, there is no shortcut. When you try to do the shortcut, the distribution of power comes back and hits you after some point. So that's the first point. And, and a lot of people think I'm very conservative when I say this, but I'm saying this is my realistic and pragmatic approach to change. And it's actually a very radical way of, of achieving change if you understand how radical you have to be to actually achieve change in this kind of context. Your second question was about bad policy advice from foreigners. And I've been arguing about that for a very long time. I've been arguing against both the good governance view, but also some misguided and simplistic developmental state views. I gave the example of you know, what ca catastrophic interpretation of that in Ethiopia and catastrophic interpretations of good governance in many developing countries where good governance reforms actually ended up with higher levels of corruption, more violence, et cetera. So the answer, Muhammad, is basically you. You know, you have to, people like you studying in uh, places like the Nelson Mandela School have to acquire the capabilities of standing up and arguing your case. The reason why, you know, so, so there is also a, a kind of power in discourse, right? Discourse also has its power. I told you about ideological sources of power. The reason why certain people have the power to occupy spaces in this discourse, because they have better techniques, they have better language, they publish more, Right? And, and that creates a discourse power. And I think that in a, in a sense, if you can say, look, I have evidence which shows this doesn't work. I have evidence which shows that something else will work and your methods are just as good as theirs. And you can publish, you know, so that's, that's your source of power. Then you can take on these you know, foreigners coming with half-baked ideas about your country or your continent, but their power is based on the fact that they have studied at Yale or Harvard and they've published things and, and they can use techniques and they can do econometrics, right? So you have to break that power by saying, you know, I have those, I have better techniques and my techniques show you that you are wrong and the evidence shows that something else will work. So that's my second point. And the final point is about foreign policy. Foreign policy is absolutely connected with the political settlement because foreign policy reflects the global distribution of power, right? So actually countries have very limited um, freedom of choice in what they do because they're hemmed in by what other countries and particularly more powerful countries will do in response to their actions. So that is why 
a lot of developing countries are in a space where they're playing off other countries who are more powerful with, than them with each other. And it looks often like a very amoral game, but it is because developing countries are actually trying to protect their interests. Now, here is where it becomes quite controversial because some leaders might think that allying ourselves with this bloc is in my longer term interest because they're going to fund me and my politics. Or if I ally myself with that bloc, they're going to fund my party and I will then win against my local competitors. In other words, global politics very rapidly interferes and intervenes in domestic politics because that rent source becomes globalized, right? So I can, if I'm a political party in a country, and if I say, if I ally myself with that bloc, they will give me lots of money for my party and I will be able to fight my competition. And the competition then starts thinking of allying with another bloc. Then you have complexity. Again, the answer is not that we have any simple answer to this complexity. The answer is you understand the process. You understand this equilibrium between power, interests, and capabilities, and then find ways of intervening in the right place where you have a chance of achieving your objective. Now, I'm assuming that all of us share some common objectives. And our common objectives are that we want more inclusive societies, we want more equal societies, we want more productive societies. If, you, if that's your agenda, you can use that to ask which intervention where is likely to find myself you know, in, in terms of uh, 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 achieving outcomes by exploiting some of those self-interests. But actually, you can use a political settlements framework for any agenda, right? So if I was someone who wanted to foment racist hatred or tribal wars, I could also look at the configuration of power and say, what is the best way of creating um, havoc and hatred? Um, so in that sense, tools can be dangerous. I use the political settlements framework for understanding a progressive agenda. And I think that you can't get away from that. You know, We need a separate kind of discussion about what is a progressive agenda, because that's not inherent in any framework. That's not inherent in any analysis. And, and when it comes to foreign policy and, and the global political settlement, that's an extremely good space for saying, what's our ethical agenda here? What are we actually trying to achieve? Is it just to understand how these different players are acting and put my head underwater and survive? Or are we actually going to talk about global ethics? Even though we don't have the power to do anything about it, we, it's important to put that out on the table. So lots of interesting points in your question, Mohammed. I, if I had time, I would go on, but we don't. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Mustafa, and th thanks to Mohammed Ali. You really, uh, I think, um, allowed the discussion to proceed to a point where I was keen to also uh, for it to go, which is really to see how we use this framework to really advance um, social values, values of justice, of equity, um, of sustainability, um, you know, and, uh, you know, our, our response to climate change. How do we, um, you know, work uh, to, you know, for a global public good, like saving the, 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 uh, the earth and, um, working together to advance those objectives. Um, so those are some of the, 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 the policy objectives, I guess, that policymakers should be asking. But you, what you have done, Mustaq, is you've given us a, a, a framework, an analytical framework that we could use to understand better how we could um, uh, bring together the different uh, interest groups, um, but in a way which uh, you know, is realistic, recognizes the political uh, and uh, power configurations that exist. <clears throat> uh, but really, at the end, we want to use this analytical framework to advance uh, values, <clears throat> the values of justice, of development, of equity, and balance. So I want to thank you very much. I know we are uh, at the end of our time, uh, and I don't want to delay the, the meeting much further. I know some of you may want to move on to other meetings, and Mustaq is in Bangladesh. It's uh, late in the evening now there. So I want to bring this to a, to a close. I want to thank everybody really for participating. The um, uh, 
the Nelson Mandela School, um, the uh, organizers, Petunia Tembella and her colleagues who've been in the background uh, putting this together. And uh, all of you who've participated, uh, our students who've been keen to listen to you, Mustach, and as you heard, the demand is for one more lecture <laughs> before the end of the year. So we'll have to look at your availability uh, again. But I want to thank you most of all, Mustach, for really the passion, the energy, and really the commitment with which you have really um, delivered this lecture and uh, the commitment of your work, your research and your analysis is to help us understand, particularly those of, those of us in developing countries in Africa, in Asia and Latin America, who are really dealing with very complex challenges and uh, to help us understand how best to, um, to move these different processes towards uh, the social change that uh, we'd like to see in our economies, in our countries and uh, uh, globally. So thank you so much, uh, Mustaq, uh, for being with us today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks to everyone else for participating uh, in, this, uh, in this webinar. I wish you all a wonderful afternoon. Those of you in countries in the South and those of you in the North, uh, wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you all.